Welcome to Football Daily, and this is how Sir Alex Ferguson changed English football. In 2022, the Premier League will turn 30, marking a momentous anniversary for the most popular sports league in the world. Since its inception in 1992, the modern incarnation of the English top flight has taken the globe by storm, reaching as many as 3.2 billion viewers in the 2018-19 campaign. Fast-paced, chaotic, innovative and at times just downright outrageous, the Prem has built up quite the identity over three decades, treating worldwide audiences to sport in its most dramatic form. One man there from the start was Manchester United manager Alex Ferguson. By the time he retired in 2013, he had won 13 of the 21 Premier Leagues his side had contested, alongside multiple successes in the domestic cup competitions and in Europe. He also helped shape the culture of the competition, perhaps more than anyone else. From the tactical and scientific developments which helped take the sport into the 21st century, to the vast international growth which has seen Premier League clubs become beloved the world over. But how did the Scottish coach come to have such a big impact on the English game? Welcome to Everything You Need To Know, the series where we give you the story behind some of football's defining moments. Born in Glasgow in 1941, Alex Ferguson's upbringing had a profound effect on his later success. Not only did growing up in the city's tough shipbuilding district of Govan instill him with a strong work ethic, but he also began his football education with the prestigious Drumchapel Amateurs. His career would eventually take him to Rangers in 1967, and it was a good time for football in the Scottish city. In 1968, Celtic won the European Cup with a team of entirely local players and managed by the legendary Jock Steen, who Ferguson would later work with in the Scottish national team setup before Steen's untimely death in 1985. Ferguson was a sharp-elbowed attacker, known for his physical battles with defenders and his hard graft in the forward line, and these attributes would later serve him well when he went into the pub trade. He later credited his experience of running pubs with giving him the skills to navigate the football world, and it was a tough job too. His staff were once threatened by a man with a shotgun, and Ferguson would regularly have to step in to break up fights, often coming out with a black eye or a split head. An extreme crash course in man management. He carried on working as a landlord even while managing St Mirren in the 1970s and developed a young, exciting team in Paisley which came to be known as Fergie's Furies, transforming a side whose crowds ballooned from 1,000 in 1974 to 20,000 just four years later. And he did everything at St Mirren Park, from ordering matchday pies to establishing a club newspaper to driving around town with a loudspeaker to encourage locals to attend games. The kind of all-encompassing hard work he would later become famous for at Man United. He was hired by Aberdeen in 1978, finally giving up the pubs to go full-time. Ferguson worked wonders with the Dandies, breaking up the Celtic Rangers duopoly to claim the league title three times in eight seasons, with no club outside the old firm rivalry having won it since. But his crowning moment came in 1983. His side defeated Real Madrid in the European Cup Winners' Cup final and went on to beat European champions Hamburg in the Super Cup. Ferguson's success at Aberdeen won him a lot of fans, and not just in Scotland. He turned down the chance to manage Rangers in 1983, was linked with the Liverpool job two years later, and in 1986 received a concrete offer from future enemies Arsenal. However, he was busy prepping the Scottish national team for that summer's World Cup, so couldn't give the Gunners the quick response they needed. The opportunity to manage at Highbury passed him by, but less than six months later, Old Trafford came calling. Ferguson has said that when Scottish people leave Scotland, it tends to be for one reason only, to be successful. His career in England certainly bears this out, but it took a lot of work to sow the seeds of success at Man United. When he was appointed manager in November 1986, the Red Devils sat in 19th, just a place above the relegation zone. And after losing and drawing his first two games, they sunk to 21st. But over the coming years, he helped modernise United in a way that would make them the flagship club of the Premier League era. On arrival, Fergie was shocked by the club's drinking culture and its effect on the squad's overall fitness saying it was almost as much of a social club as a football club. 
Just as in his previous jobs, Ferguson clamped down hard on players partying, reportedly selling Norman Whiteside and Paul McGrath because of their drink problems. And it paid off. At a time when heavy drinking was commonplace among footballers in England, Ferguson's United became more disciplined than their rivals. And by the time a new generation came through, the culture had all but left Old Trafford. In 2019, Gary Neville even declared the difference between Man United and Liverpool in the 90s as one purely based on fitness, claiming that their bitter rivals still went out drinking in the week, whereas at United it was strictly forbidden. This set a precedent for English clubs in the Premier League era, and it was telling that Ferguson's first serious managerial rival, Arsene Wenger, took a similar approach when it came to alcohol. Fergie was also hired on his excellent track record of developing talent, and with the full backing of chairman Martin Edwards, he totally revamped the club's youth setup, hiring 18 new scouts and bringing in Brian Kidd as youth development officer in 1988 to identify talent in the Greater Manchester area. By this point, Ferguson had already poached Ryan Giggs from the Man City Academy, and Kidd would bring through the biggest crop of talent seen at Old Trafford since the Busby Babes. They would help Ferguson solidify his dynasty, and while other English clubs have produced similarly large crops of talent since, none have come close to utilising them like he did. He also led the way in tactical innovation. While Wenger is often credited with taking English football into the 21st century, Man United had already brought their own continental flair to the Prem by the time the Frenchman arrived at Arsenal. The signing of Eric Cantona from Leeds in 1992, a previously unplanned move necessitated by a long-term injury to Dion Dublin, was a watershed moment with the French attacker becoming the first true icon of the Premier League. But Cantona's impact wasn't just cultural. His creativity and versatility meant Ferguson was able to play him behind the striker as a 10 to destabilise stronger opposition defences, with his side taking on a 4-2-3-1 shape in possession. At a time when most English clubs still favoured the long ball as the primary mode of attack, and even possession-based sides stuck to a rigid 4-4-2, Ferguson's ability to adapt tactically pushed United out ahead of their rivals. After all, it wasn't until Wenger turned up in 1996 and Jose Mourinho and Rafa Benitez entered the following decade that the Scottish manager was challenged tactically on a consistent basis. Perhaps most importantly though, Ferguson's reign at Old Trafford helped usher in an era of unprecedented commercial success for the English game. In his own words, he went from coaching players on £6 a week in the early 1970s to ones on £6 million a year in the 2000s, and as a manager he was the first to make the most of the new riches the Premier League offered. Winning seven of the first nine Premier Leagues, Ferguson made Man United the club to watch for new overseas audiences, building their brand on the pitch and capitalising on it by organising lucrative tours in Africa, Asia and the United States. By 2003, United boasted 53 million fans worldwide, and other Premier League outfits would later try to replicate that global reach. From Chelsea growing their support in India to the tens of millions through social media, to Manchester City setting up franchises in each corner of the world. And the legacy of his work remains. Now United's fan base totals 253 million in China alone, with the club claiming to have 1.1 billion followers across the globe. While the expansion of Old Trafford overseen by Ferguson in the 90s and 2000s means it remains the biggest club stadium in England. Between 2015 and 2017, despite continual failure to qualify for the Champions League, United's commercial revenues top that of any club in the world. And while much of this later commercial success can be attributed to the work of CEO Ed Woodward, it simply wouldn't have been possible without the foundations laid by the Ferguson administration. Despite years of underachievement and mismanagement, the Red Devils remain England's biggest football club for now at least, and it's thanks in no small part to the heritage of Sir Alex. So that was how Sir Alex Ferguson changed English football, but what did you make of it? Let us know in the comments below. And as always, if you've got any ideas for future everything you need to know, let us know too. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave it a like and subscribe to Football Daily if you haven't done so already. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.